Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theater and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time, I think, and we feel, to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theater? But also how are we producing it? And for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community, so I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome uh, everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theatre Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. Um, it's uh, day two of our uh, Prelude Festival. Welcome Anne, Catania, Bonnie Maranka. Thank you both for uh, taking time uh, to, to join us. Anybody who works in the theater in the US and especially in New York knows who you are. You both are um, fantastic workers over decades, uh, uh, decades and many, many decades in the vineyard of theater. You have been gardeners, but you also have been architects, both uh, um, of it, um, and this is quite uh, rare. And uh, I am so uh, thrilled to have you with us. It, Prelude is dedicated to emerging work, uh, contemporary experimental work at the forefront. But um, as we know, um, we need to look back and also what might be at the forefront to day in two twenties, whatever years might be um, a classical avant-garde and Bonnie, and Anne have seen a lot. They have written about it a lot. They have taught about it a lot. And it's an incredible um, an honor to have both of you here, two Italian American, right? If I, I get that right, that's somehow worked out with ties to Europe. I will just uh, very shortly um, read a, a bio. Not everybody might uh, be familiar with or be fully informed. And Catania, who also published a book, and this is also the reason why I have both of them here, both in the time of Corona, finished a book they were working on, the important books, and books are significant contribution to the landscape of theater, and they're not often talked about enough. So we have N. Catania, who's the dramaturg Lincoln Center Theater. It's perhaps the closest what we have to a national theater um, in the US, kind of a royal court or a Schaubühne, um, and of course, in a very different manifestation. And she's the co-executive ex-editor of the great Lincoln Center Theater Review. It's a fantastic publication where they put out for each production a very detailed, thoughtful, and I think uh, also profound uh, commentary in the tradition of Lessing, you know, the writings, dramaturgical writings to give a little bit of context for the place. So she, um, and Anne is the head of the Tony Award nominated Lincoln Center Theater Director's Lab. So many people all around the world know her, love her, adore her for that work over decades. She has brought thousands of young artists from all around the world, from the globe uh, to New York. And for four or five weeks, she takes time out of her life and talks about theater. They rehearse, They and she brings in a great contemporary directors uh, uh, to talk with them. And um, it has been really groundbreaking. And I think it's a great achievement in itself alone. She uh, has been three times the president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of America uh, Association, LMDA, a very important institution, I think. And she was part of founding of it. We might talk about that later. And she was also the recipient of the very first 
Blessing Award for Lifetime Achievement in Dramaturgy, Dramaturgy. We think very highly of dramaturgy in theater. We think it's foundational. Theater is an art form. It's about thinking, and some people write philosophical, philosophical treaties. Others uh, do write articles for paper. Theater people create something on stage. It's a serious artistic statement, and um, that's how it has to be looked at and not as a commercial enterprise that entertains us before or after a fancy dinner. Um, Bonnie uh, is here with us, who also just published a book, Life Timelines, Writings and Conversations, at her uh, PAJ publications over decades. She went back on her essays. Um, she has looked at um, the, uh, yeah, Anne is holding it up. Bonnie, did you show Anne's book? Oh, I, I made a mistake here. <laughs> oh, it's good here. This is it, The Art of Dramaturgy and uh, Timelines are two important books. I love the fact that you both didn't have your own books because you gave it away, but you had each other's book <laughs> um, and you looked at it. And Bonnie, in her uh, writings and conversations, really looks back also over the decades, two decades, I think, of um, theater writings. She's the founding publisher and editor of the OB award-winning PAJ Publications and PAJ, a journal of performance and art. And Bonnie was one of the first, next to ecological writing, also to really highlight what became now almost a fashion, or it's like a, a, a given that art and theater is connected, the white cube and the black a box, you know, somehow are different appearances, but there are connections between them and that we should pay attention to what's happening in the visual world and the art world, but also, of course, in novels and music. And this is what goes <clears throat> them, uh, also and uh, distinguishes them. Many of the colleagues, they really are, um, have a general uh, omnivorous interest. Um, Bonnie is the recipient of the Association for Theater and Higher Education Excellence in Editing Award. <clears throat> Achievement. And she's the author of many, many books. She published so many writers also from around the world, from Hannah Muller and Fassbinder, Furness, and so many others. But she also created performance histories, ecologies of theater, and theater writings, which received the really significant George G. Nathan Award for dramatic criticism. She's mm -hmm. emerita of theater at the New School. Even so, we claim her a little bit because she got her education at Hunter College and at the Graduate Center at CUNY. So um, we feel very close. And um, <laughs> both of you, again, thank you um, for joining and for being with us. And I'm so happy that we also have two kind of book talks in some sense. But we will look at the theater now, the American theater now. You have such an experience. You have seen, worked with, at dinners and conversations with some of the most significant theater and performance artists or musicians of the 20th century and the 21st. And to hear what you think, what you have on your mind, uh, what moves you at the moment, what you um, uh, are concerned about, I think is a, a real a privilege for us to, uh, to know. First of all, where are you guys and how do you feel today? And where are you? Is I'm in the city. And uh, Frank, you forgot to mention that um, uh, I don't know technologically if Bonnie and I are going to be able to do this, but if anybody has any questions or whatever, you're welcome to put them to the chat. They won't be live, but we'll be able to see them at some point. So we're happy if we're able to engage with people. True. Like this. So yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Just was about to get it. I'm, I'm I'm just if you watch on YouTube and you have some comments, uh, please put them in and try if we have the time. Um, and but and it's again so tell us a little bit where are you now what's what's going on in your mind what are you thinking about i'm just locked down in new york city um i've been here for eight, 18 months um my theater is closed uh we're just beginning to reopen um i, will, I have to get a pcr test 48 hours before i'm allowed in the building then i have to do a saliva test so we are not and we don't have a big staff, so even the staff isn't really allowed. We have to choose days that we can go in and avoid each other. And we do have a show um, that is just started back in rehearsal. Um, it, it's James Lapine's Flying Over Sunset, which is a new piece, new musical, that focuses on the strange coincidence that Cary Grant, Claire Booth Luce, and Aldous Huxley we're all in Santa Monica together in the early 50s taking acid. I mean, this is like way before the 60s. Um, and so he's written a musical about that. 
and we have, its first performance was scheduled um, to a sold out house in the Beaumont on the day that, the, uh, that we shut down for COVID. So we had to contact 1,200 people in the audience to have them not come. Many didn't get that text. The staff met everyone. Um, and after 9-11, some smart person on our board of directors um, insisted that we take pandemic insurance, something I'd never heard of. And I didn't even know this happened until the COVID pandemic, you know, like 9-11 or okay, Sandy, if you're not able to perform. So that kicked in at 4.30 that day. And so we were able to pay all the companies, the actors, the crews, all the way through the what would have been their scheduled runs, which in the case of Flying Over Sunset was, I mean, five months or something. And, and Lynn Nottage's Intimate Apparel downstairs was performing. That was, that was due to run another couple of months. So um, we've just been home waiting to try and come back. And, you know, things are back. I've, I've had a couple of shows canceled that I had tickets for, but I have seen a couple of shows. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll be able to op reopen the theater, which is currently planned for um, around Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. How, how do you feel about going back in a rehearsal room? It's kind of strange. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've seen one, in, one really sold out show which made me a little nervous. And I've seen others not so sold out where I, I mean, I used to, I've spent my career of 50 years. I started for the first 20, always sitting in the second balcony in the back. And then I made my way up down to the main floor where I would get house seats. And then after a while I thought, you know, I was sort of happier in the balcony. So now I kind of like to sit on the sides and have strange views. So I, I now move to where I'm a little bit further away from people. But it's, um, people seem incredibly happy to be back. And and it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I was biking back from Dana H, which is, I highly recommend. And I ran into my assistant who's off, who's, kind of moonlighting on Moulin Rouge, which is not a show I really like that much. It was mobbed. I mean, it was just mobbed with people. So I think it depends on the show and, you know, uh, yeah. it's a strange time. Yeah, yeah, I meant also for you back in the rehearsal room, but let's go to Bonnie. Bonnie, where are you? Is that, is that New York where you are? I'm, I'm in the Hudson Valley in Catskill, New York, and I'm just packing up to go home for the winter um, on Monday. Um, and luckily, I happened to have his guest the other day who stopped by, um, uh, Andy and uh, Michael from 600 Highwaymen, who, who live up in Rensselaerville. And as it happens, they were going home on the 1st. So they're driving me home um, <laughs> and I'm packing up. But um, I've been uh, here. Well, yeah, Highwaymen, they're going to take you back on the highway. They're going to take me back <laughs> home. Um, so I've been here, um, but I periodically go back and forth, you know, during the summer. I've been, I've been here since, uh, you know, this late spring, say. And um, I, I also spent uh, last summer and fall the year before up here at my house. So um, <clears throat> I'm actually looking forward to going home. It's a little bit quiet in the countryside. It's not as social you know, as I would like. And now it's getting darker and cold, even though it's quite beautiful. So so I'm looking forward to getting back into the swing of things. I actually have a ticket for the Wooster Group on um, November 6th. But I've been busy um, working on the winter issue of the journal. We're just getting to the final stages of editing, the, choosing the photographs, the cover, um, mm -hmm. all of that. And, and, I, and I started on a new book also, uh, which I hope to uh, finish in the winter. It's a collection of Dick Higgins texts, which are really largely unknown. His life as a theater man, and also his um, performance drawings, which can be fabulous discovery as scores. Mm. So I, I, you know, I'm pretty busy here because I don't have to go to a place that's locked down like Anne and. Um, and uh, you know, I c continued editing and 
and reading and, and everything and, and, you know, that way of life. Though I'm, I wasn't going to libraries where I usually like to work just to get to a neutral place and, and, and leave home. But um, so anyway, I'm ready to go back and see what it's like to be yeah. in the theater again. Right, the Mother Courage, I think it is, right? <laughs> and Bonnie, I'm very grateful to you that you are publishing my chapter on the Orphan of Zhao from the year 1280 that we did at Lincoln Center at the festival a couple, well, more than a couple of years ago. It's an interesting, mm -hmm. interesting thing to work cross-culturally with such an enormous time difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I know. It's in the winter issue. The uh, the essay from the book, the autodramaturgy, will be in the winter issue, and it's really kind of fascinating um, tr trying to work with actors, as you describe in the book, um, to get past the psychology and the psychological and method training to work on something that's based like on song and gesture. And that's a fascinating story. So that was a chapter I, I chose and, and, and Anne also recommended to, um, to have in the winter issue. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to do that. Anne and, I, uh, Anne and I actually first met in the 70s and it's an interesting bit of news because we were the first two literary managers in New York City um, because the New York State Arts Council had started a pilot program for literary managers. And we were the first two around the late, mid, middle, late seventies. And Anne was at the, um, the um, Phoenix. Phoenix Theater and I was at the American Place. So we, we go back a while and- uh, I don't know if we were, I, I think there were others, but we got some NISCA. Oh, I think we were the first the two for that pilot program. <laughs> Oh, do, you think there were, do you think there were literary managers before that in New York? I don't recall. I mean, I mean Rod Marriott was at Circle. Oh. And mm -hmm. um, Lynn Holtz and Morgan Janess were at the public. And, mm -hmm. um, and they were, there were people around. Well, I don't know. Still, you both were a pioneer. We were the two who, got, who were on that pilot program that was funded. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. That's true. Maybe yeah. That's it. Now, what, one of the things that I've been trying and failing to do um, is to create a Wikipedia page for American dramaturgy, just to document it. Hmm. Um, and uh, I worked, I reached out to about 40 dramaturgs to add information, just because several major dramaturgs have died in the last few years. Mickey, Michael Lupu at the Guthrie passed away, Doug Langworthy, Robert Blacker, who founded Sundance. I mean, some important people. And you hate to lose that, the knowledge of their existence. So anyway, everybody filled in everything. It's, it's a, right now it's a Google Doc of about 40 pages, and it has a bit of history in the United States, you know, going back through the Federal Theater Project, Marco Jones, and then obviously some st a little bit in England and then a bit in Germany. You can't avoid that in dramaturgy. But it's mostly about American dramaturgy and let the English do their own and the Canadians do their own and the Germans will issue an encyclopedia. But this is just a Wikipedia site. But mostly what it does is it lists all the staff dramaturgs who were working, just to answer your question, Bonnie, back in the 70s, where they were working, and then after that, it lists, um, it goes from 1970 to, to 2000, and then 2000 to 2020. It lists all the productions where dramaturgs were credited. In other words, all the productions that dramaturgs worked on by contract type. So you know, Broadway, off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, and then all the regional, you know, Lort Theater, et cetera. And um, everything on Wikipedia, which is not normally my favorite go-to site, but now it's like if you don't, if you're not on Wikipedia, you don't exist. All the productions are linked. You have to be linked, so they're all taken care of. You can, you know, look on uh, internet in a Broadway database and see your name as the dramaturg or linked to a theater. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah. And, and no dramaturgs have yeah. websites. Yeah. So we, we haven't been able to get this live because. Dramaturgs are by nature somewhat self-effacing. <laughs> and I mean, I think that's true. So so nobody's done I'm a dramaturg website. So we're 
forcing people to make rudimentary websites so we can get this on the uh, on the internet. But we haven't we haven't made any any. Uh, and there's a history, you know, of the craft of dramaturgy, yes. typical literary management, but it's a much bigger field. Also, move into dance and and so much. So both of you uh, created books in a time of Corona. We. We know when you're in times of hunger, you dream about food, you think about food. People, I think, in some in camps perform dinners without anything on the table. Um, what did theater mean for you while you were working on your books? What came to your mind in that time where there was no theater on stages? Maybe, Bonnie, we start with you. I, I guess, uh, well, I was writing the preface after I finished the book, uh, or well, after I put all the material together in the book, um, and I was writing the preface um, partly here in Catskill, and thinking about, you know, history and time, and I should say, one of the things I've done in recent years is I've tried to introduce the element of time in my writing to, to have a sense of immediacy. And I've always based the writing on the voice. Um, so uh, I, I kind of um, started, uh, you know, working on this sitting uh, by the river and thinking about Catskill and the historical uh, aspect of Catskill and and the river and uh, many things that were also current in the um, um, in the historical setting. For example, Alexander Hamilton, you know, had lived nearby in Albany, or, or Roosevelt was, um, you know, from Hyde Park. So a lot of these, a lot of people and different things and events and were were mentioned also at the same time that hooked into things right here uh, in the Hudson Valley. And then I would go back to New York and I would finish parts of it there. But, um, you know, I mean, at all times and also at this stage in my life, I, you know, you, you think about, you know, the value of, of, uh, of work through time. And, uh, you know, so I had already chosen the title Timelines, but I realized also going back through the book, uh, how much how much time does play a part and how, and uh, you know, in, in the book and how much, and, and through different pieces that I have introduced the element of time, by which I mean, talking about where I am and what's going on or what I'm doing or what I'm thinking as I'm writing. So the question of time and the question of uh, doing the book, I don't, I don't know whether the work became more relevant because of our pandemic situation or less relevant to the times. And I concluded that um, all kinds of artworks and all kinds of texts and writing eventually, you know, live their own lives in the world. And I really couldn't um, control uh, or it didn't matter uh, you know, what, what this meaningfulness um, was that the works would, would, um, would live their own lives in the world. But the questions that arise are, really what kind of theater do we want to see or make after this period of time, um, uh, given the conditions of pandemic? Also, uh, for many people, it was also a slow time in terms of really thinking um, uh, about the, the hectic way that people live. And, and needing to slow down. I've been writing for many years about the slow philosophy and the importance of, 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 of doing that rather than the constant networking of people and running from thing to thing. I've become also less interested in these times in artistic process and more interested in people discussing the meaningfulness of what they do and the resonance. In other words, the why of it rather than the how of it. Because people are so focused on how they did something, what they did. And you don't really know why people are attracted to certain topics or certain stories and things beyond themselves. So th those were some of the questions I asked. I wondered also about new forms of writing. Um, my own also. I've been working in a kind of 
form criticism with the text and an image, very brief. But also I wonder what kind of forms will artists create out of this period? <clears throat> Are we going to have just new stories in the same old format? Will we have new kinds of staging? I'm, I'm often you know, disappointed because a lot of the staging looks to me like it did when I first came to New York. And I wonder, you know, how, how directing and uh, productions will, will advance. Do people care anymore about experimental theater uh, or a, any notion of an avant-garde? Do people want to make art or do they want to make culture is the ultimate question now, I think, mm -hmm. that I ask myself. Yeah, that's, that's quite a big question that would fill, I think, a week of, of Siegel Talks. And Bonnie talked about time going back for you you went also through, in a way, through your career on significant uh, works in theater. You uh, worked on as, a, as the dramaturg, as someone said, is almost like a Sherpa or someone who, you know, goes on the mountains, you know, with the climbers, but they know the terrain, they know what to do. They know when it gets cold, when it gets uh, hot, when it's the time to go and reach a knot and you can't do it without them. But um, so how was that for you to go back uh, in, in time and tell us a bit yeah. what you covered? You're quoting, uh, in it, maybe you know this or not, uh, the great director, Levi Chule, who used to always say, if you're climbing Mount Everest, why not take all the help you can get? <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true, right? That's yeah. true. Um, yeah, I wrote, I wrote this book. Um, I was asked to write this book by Yale before the pandemic, and I spent the pandemic in in the really fun part of the book where you copy edit and you know do all of the, you know, hire indexers so it actually was 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 largely conceived before the pandemic um and just to answer your question i would say that the the one thing that that has characterized my life at the theater is that i've always been very curious and open to other voices and other voices of living people and voices of people from the past and I've incorporated them into my work. Uh, as I say in, um, in the book, every play that I've done by, worked on, every production I've worked on by Shakespeare, I always have an old school, old style Shakespeare variorum in the rehearsal room, which is this giant book that you have to get it now at a rare bookstore. It's not the new short paperback version, but the big one. Mm -hmm. And at the top of every page is one line and then the rest of the whole page is what everybody thought about it from the time of Shakespeare on. And that includes, of course, the most important people who bring Shakespeare down the ages to us, actors. It includes people who pretend that they're related to Shakespeare, every scholar and editor of every version of Shakespeare. Absolutely everybody who had anything to say about that line is in that book. And uh, it's, it's an invaluable resource to have. And I think whether you're talking about Shakespeare, or you're talking about Brecht, or you're talking about, you know, people from our own century, it's so interesting to hear what other people have made of things. Because you're making a production that's modern, that's your own, that is referring to what's happening, but but you don't want to be limited by yourself. You want to bring everyone in, not only the company, not only, of course, all your collaborators, but everything that you could find from the past. And, and so one of my challenges in the book was to pick a variety of plays that had different um, challenges, different time periods. And then the key thing, which I, we both know, which is the sort of secret of dramaturgy, is to interpret a text. And, and the great directors, of certainly of our era, we old ones, Bonnie and I, you know, who were masters of taking a play and finding a way of making it incredibly relevant, incredibly modern. It was like it was written yesterday, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. And so I set myself the task of trying to describe how that is done. I even wrote a little curriculum up to try and train people how to do it or show people how to approach it because that's such, that's the most wonderfully fun thing in the world. It's just thrilling. And I hope, I hope that opening that up, which I was given by some very famous dramaturgs, 
um, in Europe who work with Peter Stein can pass it on to people who are curious mm-hmm. doing it. So it's kind of like widening the circle to the future and the past. Nothing in the book, nothing that I've done will last. Nothing should be done like that's like what I'm describing in the book, but it's a sort of, you know, how to build a building model that somebody will use to build their own building that will look totally different. Um, yeah. I just thought I would like put that all out uh, in case somebody was interested. Mm-hmm. And I have to say also that the book is, uh, is, is really, uh, um, you know, lively and, and, and clear and very um, detailed, but it also shows over a lifetime how important it is to have relationships with artists, to support them through a lifetime. And I was also struck, I told Anne, by the, uh, the comparisons between being an editor and being a dramaturg. We're, we're both involved in discovery and rediscovery and archive and uh, legacy all those kinds of things and helping writers and artists support their work. You know, in a way, long before people began to talk about care, these are real care professions in a way, because you're at the service of uh, helping other people realize their work. Personally, I would have been writing much more if I had more, if I didn't spend so much time with all, all the people whose writing I was publishing. Um, I, you know, um, so, uh, you know, editing takes a lot of time. Editing and publishing, you're in service to getting other people's work realized in the same way as a dramaturg. Uh, you know, you spend so much time helping people realize their works on the stage. But, um, you know, finding forgotten or neglected authors or helping authors who should be more known than they are, the, the, those are all in the service of in the service of people, but they're all very caring professions um, in a way where you have to stand back apart from yourself in a sense and, uh, and, and work with other people. And it's part of this vast ecosystem that people sometimes forget about the booksellers, the press agents, the literary agents, the, you know, the, the producers are uh, the dramaturgs, you know, the press, all of that, instead of all these warring factions you know, I think it's important to see that this is an entire ecosystem that uh, that we're involved in. And sometimes you don't realize that when you when you're in the beginning or starting out or um, you know busy working. But if you look back over a lifetime and think, what is your life worth? You know, what what have you done? What could you have done? What things you didn't do? You know, things like that. Uh, looking just just reflecting as you do at this time in in, in life. It's really these kinds of things that are most important, the relationships, how you worked in the field, um, what you did, you know, what you did to advance the profession, things like that. Yeah, yeah. No, you both did extraordinary work. In, actually, today also the prelude artists and curators for our noon talk talked a lot about healing, about caring. Um, or, you know, connecting in a way to nature is something that's bigger and that you need to have that actually, you know, also to be a real artist and not as Bonnie says, it's not about culture. <laughs> so we do appreciate about what we do is art. We, I would love to have a book talk with both of you in our Siegel talk, maybe in November, December. Um, but I would like to ask you now um, honest question and uh, open question also, you know, about theater and performance. You both care so deeply. You actually devoted your life and your life's energy to it. You made a difference in uh, the way you help people and presented it and what you, in Bonnie's uh, work, what you preserved for future generations in Anne's case, that you shaped it in a form, like say people say a diamond, you know, you find a raw diamond, you have to cut 60 to 70% off and you have to cut it in a certain way so more light comes out (laughs) that comes in. That's why it's brilliant. And that's what Anne did. So what do you think about theater now? What do you see? What are you concerned about? What do you, what do you predict? What, because we are all, nobody has real answers now in the moment, but what do you feel is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, troubling? What, what, what do we need to do? And it's a free and open question, I know, but uh, it's important to hear from both of you was that real experience so for the get a grab on the moment we have but also look a bit forward 
Do you want to go first or shall, shall I jump in? If you like, sure, I don't mind. Um, I, I, uh, since it's been a while since I finished the book, even though I, I had to keep doing all these these um, indexing type, I mean, I had an indexer, but you know, I had to do all those stuff pre-production. Um, I, I have had time to think about it. And um, I think right now what I'm feeling the strongest is that I have come to the, come to the strong conclusion that theater, uh, consists and it has from 2500 BC uh, on, you know, it, it, it's a kind of tribe of people who um, have a tradition of working together, who, who, are, who are good at collaboration. I mean, there's always that, that cliche of the, the uh, you know, superstar artist who wants attention, but actually all the superstar artists I've worked with are the most generous people I've ever met. They're just leaders of the company. Um, but but we, we live outside of society to some degree. Um, that's the way it's been. We, we weren't allowed to be buried in, in, even in this country a hundred years ago. Um, when you see Hamlet's players pull up to Elsinore. They're there because the plague's in London, but he treats them as equals and they treat him as equals. But theater doesn't have any security. Um, maybe Moliere was having dinner with the king one night, but a month later he was pulling into a wagon in France. So to me, the, the tradition of theater, the, the tribal element, the fact that, that, that it's handed down from one generation of actors to the next, that you learn how to be a theater person is something that I'm, I'm, I feel strongly needs to be preserved. Um, it is a profession without security other than ar artistic security and friendships and collaboration, which we all, we all happen to be very, very good at. Um, and I, I worry about, what I worry about right now is I, I don't know if you can go into the theater if you have debt. Uh, I, I I don't have a lot of money. I mean, I, I've done I've been successful, but I I don't have I'm not I don't have a trust fund or anything like that. Um, but I, I I think that people who are now going through universities. I was just reading an article in the paper this morning with enormous endowments. I mean, the university endowments in this country have doubled or something in this current year. And yet people are not paid in universities. They come out with debt. They're just going to go right to TV. They have to because they can't, you can never make money in the theater. Um, I mean, you can make occasionally a lot of money if you're Patty Lapone, but then you don't work for a while. I mean, it's not a secure life and people in the theater don't want a secure life. That's their thing. So I'm, I'm worried about, you know, people who are training in places that have a ton of money but come out with so much debt. Mm -hmm. Are they going to stay in the theater or is this just a kind of way station to get a lot of attention and go and get a series in L.A.? And, um, uh, and, and Bonnie and I are old enough that, that we, we, we actually – did study, which is unusual because I work with a lot of people who came up through conservatories and trained in the theater. So they took their models as work from working actors and working directors and working designers. That's a way it's always been in the history of theater until we reinvented things in the seventies. But, but even our tuition was virtually nothing. So we didn't have to pay it down or, or we did very quickly. Um, and that gave us a freedom to, to go on unemployment or work with some nutcase who turned out to be brilliant, you know? And I don't know whether if you have those financial responsibilities, it's as easy for you. So I, I'm kind of in a mode where I, I'm, I'm thinking it would be great if, if theaters reinstated their conservator, conservatories and people could train with working actors, working directors, working designers, working administrators, 
the way that it has been this apprentice tradition from the the beginning of time. So that's that's what's on my mind. Mm -hmm. So you feel that um, that old model of Goethe wrote about in Wilhelm Meister's, you know. <laughs> A wonder years, you know, where he learned about theater. He follows this theater company and it becomes formative. Well, um, I mean, the, the word playwright, it comes from write, W-R-I, you know, like a wheel write, you know, you, or a, mm -hmm. you learn how to make a wheel or you learn how to shoe a horse or be a miller or be an artist, you know, by working in a workshop and where you learn from somebody who knows how to do it and then you develop your own style. Um, which might be the opposite of the person that you work with, but but there are, but it's not that you're learning only the art. You're learning the life. You're learning the way of being. Um, that that's important, um, and and that is that's something that's on my mind. Hmm. Funny. What do I what do I think about where What am I thinking about now? Yeah, but when you think about theater and performance, what concerns you? Well, what concerns me is just the nature of theater itself. I would like to see more works of the imagination. I would like to see um, less um, of a journalistic theater that's just making statements about politics and just being satisfied that that's enough. I, I, I you know, there's a reality uh, that, there's a, artworks have a reality that they create, and the and the and the world outside is another reality. Um, I just think that um, people have turned away from imagination, um, in you know, in a sense, and um, and I spend I spend a lot of time duplicating um, global crises on a you know on a in a kind of local sense. Um, and, and so much of it is just a, a kind of lamentation. And I, and I feel that we, that, you know, even in the worst times, if you think of the theater between two world wars, um, the imagination of catastrophe even brought forth great imaginative works. Um, thinking of, uh, you know, Witkiewicz, especially the Polish theater or the German theater. So it's not that I'm telling people, you know, I'm thinking that people should turn away from crises, but I, but I, but but be more theatrical and um, imaginative in terms of responses. Also, I miss the kind of uh, poetry or privacy in the theater as well. I can enjoy that as much as uh, you know, big spectacle too. I, I don't know where theater will go. I think the impact of um, the pandemic and uh, the digital and people working on Zoom, I don't know how much people, how, how the definition of live will change or what we would consider theater, like people talk about digital theater, Zoom theater, all of that. Um, what, will, what will be funded? Will you be able to get theater funding if you're just working um, on a computer, you know, on, on the computer? A lot of people I spoke to really couldn't stand watching a lot of theater on, on the screen. Um, though other people enjoyed archival performances or historical performances, for example. But for theater people, it's really not the same to sit in front of a computer and watch something. But will other generations change that notion of the live? I, I don't know. Um, there's such a focus on contemporary because the curriculums have changed so much and they focus on the contemporary. Um, when I was in graduate school, you didn't really study the contemporary. You studied the past and you studied uh, other cultures and countries and everything. But now there's such a focus on the curriculum and contemporary culture that I'm worried that people, you know, won't have the knowledge that it takes to be to really produce great artworks, and um, I, I don't know what the situation in academia um, will be because everything is like feeding the system. And what's the point of having all this theater training and then just trying to get into Netflix to do something? I mean, in a way, the theater in the '60s gave up what later became Netflix and Amazon type um, pieces. 
the psychological acting, the story, the theater gave that up in the 60s and moved toward the avant-garde. And now it's a very conservative period in a way with the domination of stories and narrative and uh, strong psychology. So I'm not sure you know, where we're going or where there will be room for real experimentation. I don't find there's much discussion about that now and uh, there's more discussion of stories. So um, I, the kind of theater that I would like to see, as I said, is a more poetic, philosophical, uh, you know, deep kind of theater, but also politically engaged. I don't know why there aren't more pieces about the, the loss of democracy or about fascism. Um, uh, you know about other kinds of topics now that are really strong and in the air. We don't we don't seem to have a theater that deals much with utopia and uh, and these kinds of things. So I, I would like to see some parts of our theater you know move in that way, and uh, I would definitely like to see a change in um, in in theater study away from an obsession with theory. There's too much conformity today, I feel. Mm -hmm. And is, is there a loss of history? Well, I was just thinking what my, interesting what Bonnie was saying. I mean, um, I think the, I think one of the things you didn't say, Bonnie, was that the reason that that we what what we studied, which was the work of the past, was because we were the work of the future. In other words, we would have to study all those plays. I mean, not have to. We studied mm -hmm. But then we would run to New York, right, and see them, and see all the new stuff. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was it was uh, out of our, you know, we 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 were going to take everything that we knew and and support the work that would change the theater. It wasn't at all like we were imitate going to imitate that. But right. I think I think I think uh, a, a thing you brought up should be should be underscored. I mean, if you look at Shakespeare's work in the in the 1590s, you know, the word succession was banned by law. You could not utter that word because Elizabeth was too old to have children, and there were no heirs, and uh, you know, it, it was forbidden to talk about. It. He died in 1603. Every single play he wrote, no matter if it was a comedy, a tragedy, a history was great it, pe people went and had a great time but it's it's reading in the middle of the each of those plays all about what's going on in the world politically in london during that decade so in other words it's a play that's operate the plays are operating on many different levels and you can go and watch on whatever level you want you can just go and have a good time and laugh or you can go and see it as a contemplation of succession and how people rule and you know etc., which was absolutely on everyone's minds because they were, you know, very aware of the political events of the day. And I think it's that it's that multi-layered approach uh, of nuance that you're to some degree talking about. The other thing that 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 struck my struck me when you were talking is that this is something nobody talks about, but it's the most important thing. Um, which is the audience. I mean, reading your book and thinking back to some of the performances that you mentioned that you saw, and I, I saw some of those as well. I, okay, maybe they were in a loft in some abandoned part of Soho in 1971, but it was impossible to get into them. I mean, they were mobbed. And, and the reason I say that is because they found their audience and and no one will give you a success in the theater except an audience that is that you're speaking to in some way. And and it, it, as I said, it, it, we were talking about, and I were talking. It could be the group theater it broke in the middle of the depression. Who somebody gave a house to upstate, and they went up and they said, "Okay, Frank, you write the play." And you said, "Well, I've never written a play." That was Clifford Odets, and you act in the play, Ilya Kazan. Okay, they, they made the play, but they brought it into New York. And there were 1,100 people there the first night mm -hmm. who'd never even been to the theater from the Lower East Side going strike, you know? So it's got to, 
you can't do something and say, bring me an audience. Your audience has to come to with you. You have to bring them along. I mean, I work, when I first came to Lincoln Center with Bernard Gersten, now passed away, who was the founder of the Public Theater and founder of Zoetrope Studios and re revived Lincoln Center Theater. Mm -hmm. He used to say there's an actual particle that is in the universe that I've named. It's not an electron or a proton. It's called a theatron. And it's the particle that goes back and forth between the actors and the audience. And the actors hit it like a tennis ball, and then the audience hits it back harder. And then the actors hit it back even harder. And then when it's going, you're really cooking. And he used to say, I always go to curtain down when I'm in the building just to see if those theatrons are moving. And if they're not moving, the theater is dead. And, and that has to be generated by the artists who make it. It isn't, it isn't an audience that is, you know, like in school forced to come to your show. It wants to come to your show. It, it mm -hmm. wants to be, you know, squeezed into that loft and Rhoda in potato land. You know? <laughs> Just, you're, you're, I don't know, you probably were there like the lucky 60 people who got to see that. I mean, that that's just how it's always worked. And yeah. you can't expect to, to do something and have people come by, by, um, by being forced to come. They have to really want to come and see that. And that's a mysterious phenomenon, how that theatron gets kicked into gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't forget, I was married to someone who was in Rhoda and Potato Land. <laughs> <laughs> it lasted for five months. The Richard Foreman play lasted five months. Oh, really? That was the run? Wow. <laughs> he thought he was going to be in for a couple of weeks, but it, it was such <laughs> a, a big hit. I, I wrote about it, an entire page in the Soho Weekly News. Imagine having a whole page of, in a newspaper writing about one show. Well, well, that, well that's, a, that's something else. I mean, the Soho, I, wrote, I used to write for them, and they did, they did an article about literary managers that I was in. I mean, that's yeah. something we really miss now. I mean, it's part yeah. of a problem in our culture is that we have so little coverage of things. I, I mean, know, the voice is gone, the Soho paper, the New York press. There is no real criticism. I mean, the, the, the Times has become such a celebrity-driven rag in, in terms yeah. of theater. There's no serious theater. There is some in that paper, uh, you know, for visual arts, but not for theater at all. It's all yeah. celebrity and money-driven. And I think, I think for audiences, especially young people who come to the city, you know, they're looking, I, I'd never heard of Richard Foreman until I came here and then I saw something or I saw a listing and decided I would go try and get in. So I don't know how theaters that are starting up find audiences because there's no, you know, I guess Instagram and Twitter and people have to get on the right sources, but it's yeah. not as, it's not as uh, I always thought one of the things I would do if I wasn't, in the artistic side, you know, there's always a hit show somewhere like, you know, when Chorus Line was at the public, you know, there would be, you know, hundreds of people who couldn't get into the Newman. And I thought they should have kiosks that would say, okay, you didn't get in, but here are 10 shows that you can get to within 10 minutes. They're all yeah. in the East College. Go over and buy a ticket at La Mama or go buy a ticket, you know, that you could sort of spread the wealth around because there's so much to see. But how do you know what it is and how do you, you know. That's it. I mean, who's going to, you have to go to a constant number of websites to find out what's going on. And I refuse to do that. I, you know, I just don't even know what, what to go see. You don't, and also because there's no discussion, even people who make theater often don't really discuss it as art. You never know why any one thing is more meaningful than another. It's mm -hmm. very hard in the current uh, situation to, to, uh, to, to, to feel what's important to see uh, or to know and why. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, does, it, it doesn't seem particularly hard to do to create a kind of centralized site where where things could be listed uh, along with people who love them, you know, so that so that maybe you've never heard of the artist, but it, it's like 
Bonnie Maranka says, go check this out. They're really interesting, you know, so that you begin to get a, a network going um, mm -hmm. that isn't just the, the graduates of your school or just, or your roommates or something. Yeah. That would be a valuable thing to do. Maybe we should talk Facebook into doing that too. Yeah. <laughs> reputation. Yeah, yeah. Our great uh, team that designed our uh, Seagull <laughs> There's something simple that can be, and it's true. We don't. Yeah. We, and more and more is done. The more and more is produced, and less and less we know. You know, uh, we eat more, but perhaps it's less healthy. We have more calls and contacts, <laughs> but we have less time with families. You know, so there's something there that uh, theater has to be part of a change, and and to help to create sense. It makes sense. You both, in, in a way, what I also my are internationalists, whatever they mean, globalists or something, you know. What do you feel about American theater? Is it, has it opened up? Is it insular? Um, what, <clears throat> I know that for both of you, it also was important to be outside the, the Americas, but um, what do you think at the moment of American theater? You know, I was just going to say, that now that you mentioned that, because it's something that always bothered me, uh, uh, the, the U.S. is notorious for its poor history of translation. And you can imagine that plays are at the bottom of the heap, um, in, in, you know, even though the record is so poor with novels. I don't know if you remember, Anne, but I, I can recall in the 70s going to Broadway and there'd be translation of the German plays or something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or plays from other countries. Um, but, you know, you don't see that much translation. Our theater is really dominated by, uh, I'm talking about Broadway or some, you know, um, production uh, of, a, of a play, not, a, not, a, not an opera or more performance oriented thing. There's very little chance. Most of it is done in the universities, but the major European writers are not available to um, to, to most of our theaters or certainly not to Broadway um, anymore. And uh, we do get a lot of international work at the Armory or um, at Brooklyn Academy of Music for very high priced tickets. But there is so much going on in Europe that we never see. So many great works that I hear about or that I'm fortunate enough to see when I'm traveling um, to Europe. There, there's a lot of serious, serious work. And a lot of our funding went along who was paying for what country and culture at what festival, you know, which country paid for something to come. Um, so I don't know, it's... It, it's yeah, it's I mean, I mean, if you've been on the inside as we have, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the, the plays that we were able to see from other countries were paid for by those other countries who had arts funding. We really did not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're referring to a time on Broadway, and you could also add in the many festivals that have gone out of business. Like we had a great festival at Lincoln Center where you could see right. all kinds of work that closed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is that you would see, you know, Diana Rigg or something in a, in a Greek play, or, or you would see... Um, um, you so know, Purchase or, College had Strayler coming. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just all, all kinds of things. But yeah. that's it, it, it. It's something that is, you know, it's expen enormously expensive to do. It's never paid for by Americans. They're not really interested. I mean, they have to raise the money from the countries that send the work. But I always found. I mean, I've actually done a number of initiatives to try and change that. And 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 I don't know whether it's just my own interest or whether the director's lab changed my, my view of it, but, um, you know, it, it, my focus hasn't been strictly on Europe. It's been on very other, you know, very different parts of the globe. I mean, I always found it odd, and it's just a, sort of a characteristic of America. I mean, if you look at the population of the United States, how many people speak more than one language? And in, the answer 50 years ago was nobody. Um, but when the NEA was founded, you know, the, the, and the theaters were built by the Ford Foundation in 1967. The statistic was 2% of the United States citizenry had ever been in a theater um, because it's a nation of immigrants, non-educated. But, but now more people have, well, not in COVID times, have gone to go to the theater than go to football games. I mean, people really took to it. And, and now we have so many immigrants. I mean, I would say... 
50% of the people in this country speak two languages. They speak, they came from somewhere, they speak that language, they came, you know, they now speak English. And yet we feel very, very, a certain swath of the population, really the people making decisions about publications and things like that, don't. Um, and, and there's so much theater going on you know, in Indonesia and India, and obviously Japan and Africa and stuff. I mean, I, I see that because of the director's lab, which is extremely international, that, um, that my own attempts um, were to sort of, you know, it's like in Ibsen's Pier Gint, this is one of my favorite metaphors, when you can't get through, you have to go around. He's, the boy says to him, to Pier, go around when he's, when he's um, lost. And I, and I thought maybe the solution would be to find individuals from different cultures who would create theater together that was a sort of synthesis or something that they agreed on rather than bringing the Bolshoi in, which is worthwhile doing. They're fantastic, but it costs $5 million. Um, uh, th that there might be a way of actually making work that is truly a collaboration between different countries. And I, I made a whole plan how to do this. You know, I mean, a theater in Seattle it, it could invite somebody from Iceland or something or from Kenya to, to come for a month in a rehearsal space, provide some actors, put them up at, at the house of a board member, and then do a presentation for a couple of days. And what would be done with this director and American actors would be and designers would be very interesting. I mean, you could jumpstart a lot of things like that relatively quickly. Um, and and it hasn't gotten much traction. I started with uh, a couple of other people, a National Theater Translation Fund, which included a whole subsection on translation from African countries. And I could not get anyone to house it. I mean, and it wasn't that big. I mean, it would be an obvious uh, resource for people. And there's all kinds of stuff translated that you don't know about. Got turned down. Couldn't do it. So, New York Library of Performing Arts, right? Said no. There, don't. There's not going to be any interest in that, you know. Yeah. I mean, what can you do? So, yeah. I mean, it's 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 simply opening people's minds to things that they've never imagined. Like, my God, this is a play, or th this can look like this, or this can be about this. And, and there's so much interesting stuff happen that's happening and has happened that that we don't know about. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, somebody needs to figure out how to, you know. And then we have equity regulations. You know, I've done many <coughs> panels, um, and and you see, you see, Poland was the worst. You know, you see productions by young Polish theater directors. They look like, you know movies that cost $3 million, you know, fabulous actors, three cameras, fabulous production, you know, finishing. And Americans are, for good reason, aren't allowed to bring cameras into any rehearsal because equity doesn't allow it because you would have film of, I don't know, I'm picking a name, Al Pacino when he was 20 doing Richard II and he wouldn't, you know, they don't want that, the actors in here are too good. So you can't bring a camera in America into an equity rehearsal or a production without paying. You can, you can, I mean, we have shows that are shown on PBS, but that's like a huge budget thing. So it was very hard to get American directors into these places because they had no work to show, not because of their own fault, but because of union issues that were always surprising to people in Europe. So there are all kinds of sort of hidden barriers to this international thing that haven't been figured out yet. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the Euro take the European festivals, um, I mean, there are festivals in Asia as well, and they have an enormous amount of really great, high quality artworks. And it's a shame we don't have any of that here in this country. Yeah. You have nothing like that in New York City. And sometimes when things appear, they're, they're here for a couple of days. Which is amazing. We're, you know, you you just can't possibly see the work, or they can't get an audience um, in one day, or two two appearances, or something. 
Um, it's it's really, there's so many things that need to be changed, like widespread throughout the society and culture. We're just so backward in, in many, many ways. We, we need such a revamp of structures. And I, I don't know, maybe your artists and people have to just protest more and not leave uh, lobbying to professional lobbyists, you know, and art, for, 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 for arts advocacy and that kind of thing. It's all left to lobbyists and institutions. Well, I mean, I, I've been, I've lobbied. I've went, I, went to, I went to DC with a very savvy lobbyist a couple times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was sent, I, to, I was sent to a uh, visit a, a, uh, senator with an extremely famous actor because our families were had my mother's family were cattle ranchers and this actor was from a ranching background too and we were sent to the senator from montana who had voted to disband the nea yeah. and he had become the senator from montana because he had run a campaign uh called montana the last Best Place, which was the title of a book of short stories written by Montana writers, funded by the NEA. He'd stolen the title for his campaign, his campaign uh, run, and there's a lot of good writers in Montana. And um, and you know, we said it was like, have you no shame? You know, and now you're voting down the thing that gave you your. He voted it down. I mean, it's really tough. I mean, you read the paper every day. It's, you know. And then he had his picture taken with the famous actor on the way out. <laughs> yeah. So, I, don't, I mean, the lobbyists are there. They, they get it. It's not them. It's, I don't know. No, it should be, I'm saying it should be artists and people in the theater who, who maybe have to become more public about these things. Yeah. Uh, like in Europe, where, 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 where cultural policy is also a matter of elections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when was the last time you heard anyone discuss a, um, cultural policy in a debate? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, yes. It's, it's non-existent, even in New York politics. You know, another thing I think that could be helpful to theater, to uh, artists, would be if the universities opened up their theaters to uh, theater companies, because often the universities around this country have have the biggest and best plants and places than Always. people working down down downtown or in Brooklyn somewhere, and they're all just empty um, much of the year. Why why don't the, why don't the universities open up to professional or semi professional theater people and, and have some integration of education and um, and professionalism? And you and use these theaters more, and and, and um, uh, you know there are a few examples of that. New York Stage and Film is on a takes place on a campus in the summer, and Williamstown, and and I think Frank, it was you, maybe I'm wrong, who had this amazing and brilliant idea to take all of the huge theater facilities here in New York City that were owned by the City University of New York and mm -hmm. to make them available yeah. for yeah. theater, for neighborhood theater. We're gonna have a, another panel also on Friday. We are thinking, how can we help to create a citywide festival in 2023 in the summer? How will mm -hmm. we collect parks, neighborhoods, parking lots, but also the CUNY theaters. It is the largest uh, mm -hmm. system actually in the nation, terribly underfunded, need to be rented out to make a little bit of money. But I think now in the time where popular theater also in a way, um, has gone away. It is the city university, so we should also have theater for the city, for the people, for the workers, um, who you know, with affordable um, prices. And we'll see what we um, what we can do and, and make happen. Perhaps. The yeah, I mean, I mean, again, this is why it's so important to remember what's gone before, because it tells you what's possible to do. Tell us. I was very close and a great admirer of Adrian Hall, a director who came out of West Texas along with Garland Wright and Robert Wilson at the same time, who started a theater in Providence, Rhode Island called Trinity Repertory Theater that was based on 
the repertory and the and the organization of the theater was based on Mrs. Hallam's company, an itinerant post-Elizabethan actress who had picked up her company and gotten a sailing ship and came to the United States after the revolution. And, and you know, like in Huckleberry Finn, you know, just they come into town and they put on a show kind of thing. He took some of the repertory from her and, and started this theater in, in Rhode Island. Okay, it's a small state. He went immediately to meet the governor and talked the governor into um, funding every high school student in the state coming to the to Trinity three times a year. So every person who grew up during Adrian's tenure, which was about 20 years in Rhode Island, saw 12 or nine plays, and whether it's a three year or four. So they were used to going to the theater. They knew how to go, and, and he was doing all kinds of stuff. Classic work, very cutting edge new work. He was working with Eugene Lee, who you know is the set designer for Saturday Night Live, but a very avant-garde designer. Um, you can always see the, the stage, nothing's hidden, it's not illusionistic in any way. And, and so he had the politicians involved, he had students involved. I mean, one of the reasons we're, we're in trouble is because we don't have any arts education in the schools and kids don't know art, they don't have art classes. Um, and, and, and that has a, a terrible effect. I mean, I mean, right after, this is a strange thing to be saying on this Zoom, but right after Columbine, for some reason, just a coincidence, I was invited to speak at the, at the actor's studio about something. This is after the, you know, the, the old guard was dead, a younger, very smart moderator. And it was such a shocking time. And he, he said the most amazing thing, he said, if they hadn't cut out arts education in Colorado, they used to have a lot of arts education in Colorado because they taxed hotel rooms with something called the ZAP tax, zoos, arts, and parks. Arts is kind of hidden in the middle, but a lot of theaters were built and sustained by the ZAP tax. They cut it out. They, and he said, if there had been arts education in high school in, in Colorado, that kid would not have shot that school up because he would have seen a picture by Edvard Munch or he would have read a play by X and realized that's where I need to go. You know what I mean? Not everyone is like people in my high school. There's a world that's outside that is greater that I don't need to just feel like I'm, you know, about to kill myself. So I'll go in and shoot some people. But he had, he had no idea. All he was doing was playing video games. And I thought that was really profound. I mean, I'm a great admirer of Dana Joya, who was the NEA head for a while. And he thought up, he was just thought up so many ideas. He thought up the idea of the great read, which, which is an idea where every city chooses an author from that city. And then everybody reads a book or two of, the, of that author's book, book clubs, the schools read them, the libraries display them, so that it's sort of like across the city, everyone's reading a book from Milwaukee or from, you know, from Cheyenne, Wyoming. I mean, it, it, it ties it to a place, but it also moves through class hierarchies. You know, it, it's those kinds of national thinking. It's a little bit like the Federal Theater Project. Yeah, you know, tell us about that. So I'll think about it. But I mean, you, you pointed out how big the impact the Ford Foundation was of funding of American and um, also regional theater system, but also New York, I think Lincoln Center in a way, if I'm right, it also- It was funded, yeah, it was paid yeah, for. But the Federal Theater Project, did you think it had profound impact on American theater? Uh, well, the, uh, I, I think the Federal Theater Project, and, uh, and there's also, a, you know, music projects, or Hurston was involved in that, you know, there's a lot of stuff, um, uh, was, was, was very widespread and a lot of people were involved in it. But in the same way that the NEA was brought down because of homosexuality and the objection to that, that was what shut down the NEA, reduced its funding. The Federal Theater Project was closed because it was accused of being communist. And the reason it was accused of being communist was that several, a number of people who were involved in it as artists and as managers had 
uh, you know, what's the word? You know, Tired. were not anti-communist. I don't know that they were communists, mm -hmm. but you know, it's during the whole leading up to HUAC. And so it was in both cases politics that brought brought it down. And maybe that's because of the freedom of art, which will go to all kinds of places, and that's a threat. It needs to it needs to be, you know, a chorus line. It can't be, you know, Brecht's the mother that you're going to see next week. <laughs> I mean something about that 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 seems it's never changed i think it's i think it is a great streak of that still in the country yeah yeah and 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 in in a way if we if we're, if we're thinking about this it's a, it's a streak that's coming from both sides now it's coming from you know i don't know that anybody's worried about the theater being communist or gay anymore <laughs> except that but but that same that same sens censorious streak is coming from the left now. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some, and again, that's why it's such a great life. You know, the theater is so free that, you know, it's not a coincidence Freud named everything after plays, you know, the Oedipus complex. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a dark place. It's a place that can go to very, very deep places, very controversial places. It explores it tells a great story, it shows you wonderful artistry, but it goes in very strange places. That that does upset people. It can upset people who, who want something a little more simple. Maybe maybe that's um, the way it's always been and the way it will always be, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that in our time, artists, there are artists who go against the grain and who just, you know, take that freedom and not censure themselves, but just do the kind of work they really want to do. Yeah. yeah. Maybe coming slowly close, we have some time uh, to end, but I would like to hear from you in your long career of working for the theater, dramaturging, uh, editing, and, and recruit, what did you see? What do you feel like this was fun? There was the most beautiful thing. This was foundational, I something, I understood something. What are the, the pieces that worked for you? What was it? What do you what do you remember as saying this is why theater is theater performance is performance and a play is a play? Well, I wish you'd asked me that question yesterday so I could have thought yeah. about it a little bit. I mean, it's funny. The first thing that came to my mind was the first time I saw Ariane Manushkin doing Iphigenia and Aulus. I mean, that just like blew my mind. I mean, uh, I mean, there, there, were, there were really many, many, many uh, ex examples. Um, I started in, uh, in a repertory company in San Francisco with Bill Ball at ACT, and the re one of the resident directors was Ellis Rabb, and he did an amazing production of, of Merchant of Venice that really was about the Castro district in San Francisco, but it was Merchant of Venice, but somehow both were on the same stage at the same time. And I was fortunate to see productions by Giorgio Strahler in Italy and Peter Stein in Germany. And I mean, uh, you know, um, just help me out here. The, the, uh, Medea that Fiona Shaw did, De Deborah Warner's show at BAM. That was an incredible. I mean, there, there, there are there's so many um, uh, that it's kind of hard to pick pick one that really hmm. I would highlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I, you know, I, I, I. There's so many great works. I, I would say you mentioned Strayler. I would say The Tempest, which yeah, was at the course, festival yeah, purchase, one of the great productions I've ever seen. I'm also very moved by 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 singers. I love uh, singers and concerts. And um, in more recent times, I think the, uh, the work of Anne, Anne Teresa de Kiersmacher mm -hmm. um, is, is really sublime and beautiful uh, use of dance and music. But there are so, so many things, you know, you're struck in different ways by, you know, as a young critic and student seeing different kinds of work. 
you know, for the first time, like Meredith Monk or Trisha Brown or uh, um, um, Lee Brewer's uh, Beckett was some of the best Beckett I've ever seen in my life, his come and go, which was done with mirrors um, in a tiny little theater when Theater for the New City was over by the West Side Highway, was, yeah. was also one of the great productions. D different productions have different meanings. I, I mean, by this time I've seen so many of the great world directors in the post-war period, and I've seen them largely um, in Europe. Uh, Ariane Mishkin also is a favorite of mine, and I, her, the last work she, not the last work, but one of the works she brought to New York, Les Ephemeres, uh, was a stunning work, and I actually write about it in my book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm 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 struck by by work that has a real strain of emotion in it or um, beauty. Uh, I, I I love virtuosity. I have to say, even if it's a kind of anti virtuosity that knows what it's doing, like say Yvonne Rayner, you know, in her famous No to Spectacle. Um, but I, I love I love performers and I've watched performing performers and performance since childhood, having been able to see on television the vaudeville and the burlesque and comics and all those things. I, I love any kind of performance. Um, and I and I, I love old movies and now I'm even more um, interested in Cary Grant movies from the 50s <laughs> now knowing he was on acid on them um, I, I recently watched a favorite of mine with Ingrid Bergman they're all I don't know if he shot films on acid but I know he took acid <laughs> oh, all I know is he's one of the most gorgeous men who ever lived yes that's um, true he, one of my favorites is this film in which he, Ingrid Bergman plays an actress and um, he's a diplomat and they're lovers in middle age. It's called Indiscreet and it's just so witty and it's so actressy with her in it, you know, the way she plays an actress. But um, I, I, you know, I, I guess I like actors more and more uh, in terms of watching them, but I, I guess I was always mostly attracted to a director's theater. And one of the great performances I recently saw was the uh, British visual artist and um, theater man, uh, William Kentridge, not British, I meant South African, oh, uh, yeah. William Kentridge. Um, he did um, a piece at the Armory a few years ago, which was just, um, uh, an extraordinary piece, and a, and a, and he had to even invent new kinds of projections. Um, I don't think a lot of theater people saw it because I I don't think a lot of theater people, um, you know, necessarily go to dance and visual arts and museums or read novels. It's not really apparent in the criticism or in the writing or in their work. Um, but but the Armory has had very uh, extraordinary things. The Heiner Goebbels. Uh, directed the, the Dutch opera, I think, a few years ago with all the sheep in it. And, um, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's... We, got to, we got to hear the Berlin Philharmonic. That was a treat. Uh, yeah. I, have, I have more mixed feelings about it. But, you know, it's funny, you're, you're saying, I, I went to William Kentridge's house. We had done a ton of South African work before Mandela mm -hmm. was released. We did mm -hmm. Serafina, as you know, we did multiple festivals of. So yeah. in place, and uh, I went to his house before anyone had ever heard of him. Mm -hmm. And I had very small children I had left behind with my husband, and uh, we were talking about our kids. And he gave me a toy that he'd made for his child, who was the same age as my child, a little alligator carved out of wood, painted with a coat hanger that, that you would push it, push it, and its mm -hmm. tail would wag. And I took it home in my suitcase. It's about, you know. Aren't you lucky? Well, <laughs> William Kentridge. He yeah. was completely, I mean, he wasn't broke, but he was, you know, he yeah. was just a working artist, hustling yeah. to make a living in, in Joburg back then. Yeah, and even being a visual artist, you know, his interest in theater, his work was Handspring Company, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I think the uh, what's well, the handspring guys were so amazing. Are yeah. so amazing. So there is there mm -hmm. is out something out that is meaningful. I, so I think for you who are in a way kind of expert, but also for you know 
the general public. And this is, in Germany, we had the great Three Penny Opera, which the people love, but also the critics, also the avant-garde. Well, we had the great Three Penny Opera that Richard Foreman directed that Raoul Julia starred in. Yeah, I saw that. Brown was in. I mean, my God, wonderful. that was a great production. Yeah. But, I, you know, I used to go to a lot of the great musicals around the 70s also. I mean, uh, Company, I saw the original Company, Follies. I saw a lot of stuff there. I, yeah. I saw... Uh, Mame and Hello Dolly and Chanel and uh, Coco and uh, applause. I, you know, I would go to everything. I just, I just, you know, love yeah. performance. And as I said, I really admire uh, virtuosity. Uh, I go to the opera when I can, and even though the staging at the Met is ra rather old-fashioned compared to uh, European opera. And, um, you know, dance when I can, as I mentioned, Aunt Teresa de Kirsmacher. Um, there's so much to see, but I, I do regret not having one forum in which you can kind of figure out what to go and see without, you know, mm -hmm. getting thousands of uh, press releases in the email or having to go to so many multiple sites. I, I've lost interest in doing that. Who yeah. has the time? Tough. For that kind of uh, work. Yeah, I mean, and also, I mean, I had a uh, talk with Gregory Mosher, who will join us for the CUNY talks. He's now at Hunter College, who said he did one of the family plays now. And he said, but I'm also proud of, you know, that I was able with some sponsors to make tickets for $25 or 27 he said, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there is something, you know, we have to be aware we accuse that was, that, that was our That was our motto, it was on our yeah. stationery. Good plays, popular prices. Yeah, and, and and we had, and I think we still have something. Uh, our, the tickets were forty six dollars, um, and yeah. and and we. I mean, I'm sorry, we have forty six thousand members. The tickets were thirty five dollars. I mean, it was cheap, and and people liked the shows, and yeah. th there were musicals. There was Spalding Gray. There was Serafina. There was Speed the Plow. There was, you know, I mean, it was it was a really a range of material. That yeah. that uh, that he and Bernie did that we had an enormous and very diverse audience um, be because the shows were good and people you know people didn't have to pay a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is something we really also have to look at. Also for us at City University, you know, what can a theater really do for the city, for the workers, for people in all the neighborhoods? That's affordable. That kids can go, families go, and enjoy life. The access to arts, the access to healthcare the access to, to education. They are fundamental human rights. And I think now, especially in the time we live, which can become dangerous again, I think we have to take a stand. We have to go out and we have to take uh, some action. And it means also bringing art and in a way, not just culture, but also art. You know, to and, and also, you know, the whole experience of culture is that, is that, you, is that you sit or stand or whatever you're doing and your brain goes into what you're, hearing or what you're watching so in, in a way it has to be a kind of a culturated experience so when yeah. you take kids it's it's important that they've been to a theater before i mean we have a big education program it's very well run but you know learning how to enter a theater and not talk or not talk yeah. back to the stage and you know again that's Adrian Hall's genius. If you've seen, if you've been there twelve times, you know a it better be very entertaining, or you're going to be restless. But b you you learn how to do it, and yeah. then when, when you're able to absorb it, and it it makes you very happy because you absorb such greatness and send you send those theatrons back yeah. to the stage. But yeah. the first time for a lot of people, it's kind of like wow, you know. It's true. The great German. There was a comedian at the time of Brecht, Karl Valentin, and he seriously wrote also to the mayor of Munich, um, whenever, 1917, and said every person in Munich should be forced by law to go to once a month to the theater. And the <laughs> mayor wrote back, this is outrageous, how could you do that? And he answered back, well, if people wouldn't be forced to go to school. Who would go to school? What kid <laughs> would go in? And, uh, and he had a point, of course, the mayor um, had one, um, too, but uh, really, thank you both. This could go uh, on much longer. We will have also a talk specifically about the book because that details and significant insights which we have to go into. But I thought um, 
it was so valuable to hear from you and your thoughts. And yeah, thanks very much for doing it, Frank. And I also enjoyed being so much with yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Anne and Bonnie, yeah, both of you um, together. And also, please accept, you know, our, um, you know, our thankfulness and gratefulness for the tremendous contribution mm -hmm. uh, both of you have made. Bonnie, almost 50 years with our Journal of Performance and Art surveying a, a landscape, writing about it, creating an archive that uh, also connect, having a, a network of friends and uh, artists uh, keeping it alive and pointing to it and end her work as a dramaturg uh, in great productions, but also the great, great uh, a director's lab and the journal which she put out uh, the magazine we had also evenings about it the seagull um it's a great model it's shining both of what you do there diamonds and uh, and i hope also for all our emerging artists you know something to look up to that two women uh, uh, put up uh, created something you know that is something to look up follow and perhaps also change it was the great carl young who said we have to reinvent the symbols and things have to, more energy has to shine through. We would do the Woodstock concert next Sunday. It wouldn't have the energy it had, but for the time that was right. But what is now right for this time? Where does the energy, we have to find that each generation has to do it, but there are, it has helped to get on the mountain. And I think both of you um, are excellent guides. So thank you both. And thanks for HowlRound again for hosting us. It's a tremendous honor to be nationwide streamed uh, with this discussion. I know we have so many international lis listeners. Thanks to the Seagull team, Andy, Tanvi, uh, and our team in Mumbai. So, Gaurav, so uh, thank you all. And I hope you will tune in tonight for the seven o'clock a, a performance. I think it will be um, a very um, interesting uh, one. And um, and check out the program and the discussions. And, and perhaps also, is there going to be small discussion about how to start a theater festival, an international and global one that's different, that is in all neighborhoods and uh, includes hopefully all the people. Is it possible or not? Or that, does New York even need it? So we're going to talk about this on Friday. But I'm happy you brought it up uh, without me prompting you. So that should be something. Goodbye. Okay, thank bye. you. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.